great to have you. Say hi to everyone who's here, those who are listening online, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, and everywhere in between. Don't forget to uh, uh, hit subscribe and the like buttons and notification bells and follow us if you can. We're going to wait for the evening offering as the usher comes forward. Those who are uh, watching online, if you like and give, you can go to our webpage, uh, CBC Truth, CBC website, CenterBeachBibleChurch.com. Jim, lead us in prayer. Dear God Almighty, uh, again, we thank you, Lord, that we could be here tonight and fellowship together and worship you and hear your word. And please bless that word uh, greatly, Lord, as it goes forth. Mm. And uh, we just thank you for our church family here. And uh, throughout the world, Lord, we are truly one in Christ. And we just thank you for that. It's a real family. And, and uh, we just praise you so much, God, for uh, your blessings in our lives. And uh, please keep us safe this week. And... Uh, Help us to serve you, and we just bring this money back according to your word, and ask you to let it go where it needs to go in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Okay, I'm all, I'm all on. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Let's turn on our Bibles to Psalm 119, verse one. A little bit of news before we uh, get there. How many people you do you remember the movies Left Behind one, two, and three? Okay. Okay, remember the actor who played uh, the pilot, Brad Johnson? Okay, uh, any of you guys remember him? If you saw the movies, anyway. Uh, he, just, he just passed away of COVID, and uh, uh, he was really sick. He has eight children, homeschooler. Uh, but he wasn't saved. He wasn't a Christian, not until the very, very end when he made those movies. Quite interesting. Uh, he made those Christian movies, and he didn't believe it. Uh, but a wife and a family, and my niece used to babysit for his kids. That's how we are connected to them. And uh, But uh, we, we've been praying for him for a while. But he's home with the Lord now. And uh, praise God that he came to know the Lord uh, before he left this earth. Uh, so interesting, and just to share that with you. Psalm 119 Verse 1, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you for tonight that we can gather together again and open up your word and have it just pour into our souls its truth, its virtue, its power, uh, its, its cleansing, its, its truth, Lord. It's truth, it's truth, it's truth, Lord. But we could listen to truth, Lord, and yet not follow it and gain no virtue from it. Let us listen and do, and be blessed. Give the winds a mighty voice, and take this message to the four corners of the galaxies and beyond, Lord. And if not there, bring it here into my heart tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Apologize for the voice. I'm not really sick. don't have the big C. I just have a cold. And you're allowed to have colds, I guess, any, you know. I have an old-fashioned cold. It's, it's not hip, you know. I just have a cold. Uh, tonight's title, this is part 16 of our study in Psalm 119. Uh, and the title is, Have You Ever Longed for It? With a big question mark. But before we get to it, we'll talk about Psalm 190, uh, 119, 176 verses, the longest psalm in the scriptures. It is basically a personal diary of King David uh, as he ponders his life and looks over his notes, kind of like a diary, of his highs and his lows. And at the end of his life, uh, with all the hardships, the loss, sickness, victories, a lot of victories, uh, problems in his family, problems in his own heart, problems with lust, was a murderer, an adulterer, Yet he was the apple of God's eye. Well, that gives us hope, right? God loved David. Not because David was so pure, but because David loved God. There's a lot to be mentioned there, a lot to be spoken there. At the end of David's life, all he can say is, God is good. No matter what, God is good. And we have to ask ourselves, can we still say that? no matter what we've been through, is God been good to us? 
In the Hebrew, there's a, a, a Hebrew title for this psalm throughout the history that the rabbis would call it. And they would call it, Happy are those whose way is perfect. And uh, it's a theme. Uh, some commentaries have said that every single verse in Psalm 119 is a message in itself. Every verse is a sermon. Every verse can stand alone. And what we've been trying to do is do that. I have gathered some together, but I've been trying to do one verse at a time. And tonight we're up to verse 40 of Psalm 119. And Psalm, Psalm 119 verse 40 says, Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Well, all I have to say as I've looked through, and I, and I know it's been, it's been hard doing this psalm because it is redundant. It's like, well, how many times, David, are you going to say this thought? Why do you keep saying it? Yeah, we get it. No, but we don't. And that's why God says, keep on saying it, David. All through Psalm 119, there's a crimson thread that runs through it. Every single verse. That happy are those whose way is perfect. Meaning whose way pleases God. There is no other way to be happy. And that's a question that we have to ask ourselves many times. I'm going to give you a bunch of examples tonight that I've been pondering. Because we can know, you know, you can go to any church, you could talk to any Christian, and, uh, and you ask them, do you believe that this Bible is the inherent word of God? Yeah, I do. Do you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Yes, I do. Do you follow everything he says? Well, not really. Well, why? Why don't we? See, that's the problem. And we know it's true. Have you ever noticed, and I'm sure everyone here and those watching online, you can attest to this. Everyone has someone in their life that makes mistakes over and over again, the same mistake. And you give them the same advice over and over again, and they don't listen to it. What do you do? Do you change your advice and say, well, they're not going to listen to that. I'll just tell them what they want to hear. No, if you're smart, if you're a good friend, you say, my friend, I'm not changing my advice. The advice stays the same. It cannot change. Example number two. I'm going to go all, all over the place on just practical examples to make this point true. If in the plumbing, one of the things I hate to do, you know, you know, obviously I could do mechanical work and I'll toy with electrical work and some carpentry, but I hate plumbing. I'm always afraid of plumbing because every time I touch something, I tighten it, it starts to leak more. You know, water starts pouring out. I don't like touching it. I, <laughs> I hate when there's a, a plumbing problem. Um, but if you're a plumber and you decide, you know what, I know I have to fix this pipe, but in order to fix the pipe, I'm going to have to shut off the water. But you said, well, that means I have to go all the way down there, go to the main, shut this off, drain everything down. So instead, you decide, I'm going to fix the leaky pipe while the water is running. It's not going to work. There's no way it's going to work. And you can try it again, and you can try it again, and you can try it again. You know, one of our biggest problems as humans is laziness. Putting in the effort. How many times, you know, doing a mechanical thing, a lot of times I work on my vehicles out on the side here, and my work shed is so far, I'm like, oh, I don't want to go back. I'm just going to wing this thing. I don't want to go back and get another tool, so maybe I'll make the hammer work. You know, I should just get up, go over there, get the right thing, and do it the right way. But laziness makes you make mistakes. How about this one? <clears throat> 
You go into the doctor. You're going to like this one because we've all heard this one. I haven't been hearing it. <clears throat> you go to the doctor. You got high blood pressure. I have high blood pressure. You got high cholesterol. I got high cholesterol. You have trouble walking. Well, I don't have trouble walking, not yet. But your ankles hurt. Your knees hurt. You have trouble breathing. And you're huffing and puffing. And you say, Doc, you know, I'm just going through this. And the doctor says, lose weight. And all of those things will come. And my doctor always says that. My sugar's a little border. It's just hanging there. Your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your sugar, pain in your ankles, lose weight. But what do we keep asking the doctor? But isn't there like a pill I can take? Another pill? Isn't there something else? No. <laughs> is there a quick fix? Because the losing weight is so hard. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to lose weight. And so we will continue on. And what's that called? Being obstinate. Being arrogant. Being prideful. Being foolish. In our world today, in our families today, the solutions are always clear. Always clear. But we keep saying, no, no, no. We need to fix that this way. I need to fix me this way. Or we say, I don't need to be fixed at all. You need to be fixed. I'm fine just the way I am. Do you know whenever you say that, <clears throat> and you know it's not true, what do they say? You can fool some of the people some of the times, but you can't fool all the people all the times, and you certainly can't fool God. Every time you say that, you lie to God. Because God says, you're such a liar. You want people to believe you're happy, you've got it together, you have no issues, you have no problems, no need to concentrate on me, I'm just fine. And you know how to say the cliché Christian answers, praise God, bless Jesus, I'm praying for you, my sister or my friend, and it's all a fake, and it's all a phony, and it's all a fraud, because pride won't let the truth come out. We need to fix the world and ourselves only one way, God's way. Because if it's not of God, it cannot work. Cannot work. Example, got a lot of examples. Welding. I used to weld a lot. I really miss welding. If I ever had another house again, I would have a 220 line ran and have my stick welder, my Lincoln welder. And I used to, I really enjoyed fabricating. We used to get, we had, you know, tons of stock steel, we cut things and make, you could just make everything. I miss it. But one of the things we used to do at my old job was we used to hold the New York State welding test. In case you don't know it, the New York State welding test is one of the hardest tests to pass. If, if you're going to weld on a bridge, on uh, stadium seating, on a crane, you have to be uh, certified. If you're going to weld on gas pipe, gas lines, that's another certification. And the certifications were horizontal welding, vertical welding, overhead welding, where it all falls on you. It's a painful situation. But when we used to give the test at my old job, they'd give you three pieces of steel, two big, massive pieces of steel that were on a wedge, a plate in the middle, and you had to weld these two pieces together and fill up the gap. And then after you welded, they would take it to a lab and they would x-ray the weld. And they would look for voids and gaps. Now, it was a brutal, noisy, loud test. It lasted all day on a Saturday, banging, and, and you had a time limit, but you were this, just to fill in these wells, and you had to do one was, uh, you know, vertical, one was overhead. Welding overhead is very hard. Uh, 
laying horizontal, not so bad. But one of the reasons why most people fail the welding test, and most did, very few people ever pass it, is because they didn't do one important thing, prep. You've got to clean your weld before you weld. And you would have an ice pick and a wire brush. And if you became impatient, you would skip that step and you would weld over the slag, which is the splatter from the weld, and it would form voids. It would look pretty. People can make welds look beautiful, but the x-ray knows the difference. Because if there's a gap or a little void or a pocket, you fail. So why would people fail this test over and over again? Laziness. Okay? What do they say about painting in the house? What's the hardest part about painting a room? Prep. Prep. It's easy to get the roller and just start going. But masking everything out, putting down the things, everything, cutting in with the brush, the, the, the wide open part's easy. And you can tell someone who, who painted properly. So we see that this is in our nature. Okay? And it means no matter how you try to save your marriage, how you try to save your relationships, how you try to save yourself, how to, you try to save your family, how we try to save our nation, how we try to save our children. If you don't do it God's way, it is vanity and all in vain. Which brings us all back to this study tonight and this title. Have I ever longed for it? Longed for what? Now that word longing it's, you know, it's not a word that we use in daily conversation anymore. You know, I've been longing for you today. Okay. <laughs> I've been longing for some 7-Eleven coffee. Imagine telling somebody at work, you know, I'm really longing for, you know, a vacation. They would say, well, what are you longing? What's that? Well, it's an old English word. <clears throat> and when we dig into the scriptures for tonight... You will see that if we don't get this right, we will never, ever, 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 never, never, ever find peace if we long for the wrong thing. Because if we don't break old patterns, people, we are people who are prone to patterns. You, if you know people in your life, I know everybody in this church. You come to a small church, I know all of your patterns. I know your faces. I know how to read everyone. And I'm not bragging. I just know it. I know when someone's upset. I know when someone's upset with me. I know when someone's making believe they're happy when they're not. And it gets me frustrated because I know their patterns. I know their responses. And I know when they respond a certain way, it's a bunch of baloney. And it's a lie, and I don't buy it. We need to break patterns. If you don't break your past patterns, you cannot get new patterns. God is in the business of creating new patterns. If you walked a certain way in the past, you need to walk a new way in the future. But it's hard when you get into patterns. You know, they say, a little side note here, as we get older, you know, we tend to drive to our house the same route every time. And it's not a good thing. They say to keep your mind active, you need to change the way you get home because it forces you to ponder a new route because we get so used to the same way of doing the same Thing, and if someone pokes us in the same place, we respond the same way, and we end up with the same pain. Break patterns. Change. Stop it. Because if we don't, we are destined 
to live a repetitive life of misery and just painful existence all due to our own stubbornness. And there'll be no growth and there'll be no change. Let's read Psalm 119, verse 40 again. And what we're going to do is we're going to break this verse down painfully, painfully, lay it out on the operating table. <clears throat> Psalm 119, verse 40. Behold. It's the first word we read. The word behold in Hebrew is hinne. It means a prolongation for lo, meaning and this is interesting, it's not what we think. It's expressing surprise. It's like all of a sudden you're surprised that you're responding in a new way that you never responded before. That's a good thing, people. That's a sign of growth. If somebody pokes you here and they, you, pump, you hit them there, and then for the first time they poke you here and you say, I love you. That's a new response. And it's surprising to you. It's something different. So in the, here the psalmist is saying, all of a sudden I saw something new and it was surprising. Go to the next words. Behold, I have longed. Now we have one Hebrew word for that phrase. I have longed after is to'ab. It means to desire. And, that, and that's all it said. So I said, well, let's look up in the Webster's Dictionary. Let's look up desire. Desire, wow, there's a lot of definitions for desire. To wish for, to long for, to crave for, to covet. To request, to want sexually. A strong wish or a craving. Sexual appetite. Lust, something that you request, a person of desire. It stresses intensity and specifically suggesting a longing for something lacking or needed in your life. It's a crave that suggests to gratify a physical appetite to an urgent need. So it's a pretty strong thing. When you long for something, it's like being in the middle of the desert and you haven't drank water in days. That's how intense it is. So David is saying, behold, all of a sudden, I have a new thirst. I don't thirst for people to think I'm great. I don't thirst to impress people anymore. I don't thirst to show everybody how great I am. I thirst for something else. I have taken my eyes off of me. Let's move on. Psalm 119, verse 40. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Precepts. Thy precepts in the Hebrew is pikud. It means appointed a mandate of God meaning the unchangeable, undisputable, unquestionable, unbending, unwavering ways and laws of God. That's God's precepts. Verse 40, it says, Behold, I have longed after thy precepts, and we have a break there, so quicken me, quicken me, well, that's a word we don't use today. What does it mean, quicken me? The word quicken me is koya. It means to live, whether literally or figuratively, causatively, to revive, to bring me back from the dead. I've been walking around in this zombie-like attitude, just giving pet responses thinking that that's the responses that people want me. Have you ever done that? You go through the motions. Because if you don't go through the motions, people are going to say, what's wrong with you? And you are afraid of them asking that. So you make believe everything is okay. 
But David says, no, I am not okay. Wake me up, God. Lift me from the dead, for I am like the walking dead. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Thy righteousness in the Hebrew, tesad akor, and this, forgive me for mutilating the Hebrew language there. Uh, it means rightness abstractly, subjectively rectitude, objectively justice, morally virtue, figuratively prosperity. It's kind of confusing. Don't know what that means. And what does this all mean? What is, what is Psalm 119 verse 40? What does it mean? What does it mean to you and I today? What is it that we should really be longing for? What do we long for? Really, every day, what do you long for? What is it? Right? Remember that movie, uh, what was that movie with uh, Billy Crystal, once to the cowboy camp? Uh, City Slickers. Right? And remember the guy Curly, Jack Palance plays it? And they all look up to this guy. He's like the super guy. And he goes, what's the meaning of life? He goes, it's just one thing. And then he dies and they never, well, what was it? <laughs> it's just one thing. And like, we never found out. People, what is that one thing to you? We might like people that they go, oh, it's Jesus Christ. I don't think it is. You might say it is. God knows better. People, let's be honest. I've been saying this every single week and really calling everybody to the mat, including myself. We all desire, with the greatest desire we can muster up as humans, let's be honest, to be happy. I want to be happy. I've, you know, I've been... Searching and pondering at the end of, you know, it sounds like ridiculous. God keeps asking me, what do you really want, Scott? I said, I guess. I tell everybody I want you. I tell everybody I want holiness. I tell everybody, I tell myself, I want to be a beacon. I want to be an example. I want to be, goes, what the, but, but what do you really want? I want to be happy. I want it all. And people, we all want that. I don't think there's anybody who says, I don't want to be happy. We all want it. We all live for it. Let's be honest. Why are you going to work every day other than putting food on your table? You want to have a good life. We all try to attain it. We all make believe we have it because we don't want anyone to think that we don't have happiness. And we all think we know how to get there. But we all, you know, what's the lesson? We fail to attain it. At least consistently. To be happy for a moment, for a time or a season. But it's not consistent and that concerns us. So what's the problem? Our problem is in the it. Meaning, we can desire this it or that it. What's your it? Okay? What is your it? Because there are two. Happiness or holiness. What do you ultimately live for? Because you can't live for one and think you're living for the other. Because God says you can't, you can't love one, you know, you can't, have, you can't have two loves. You've got to choose one. You're going to love one or hate the other. And it's a good question. Gee, do I live for happiness or do I live for holiness? Will holiness bring me happiness? Because then maybe I won't live for holiness as long as it gets, gets me what I want at the end of the day. But if I live for holiness or I want people to think I'm holy, maybe I could trick God into thinking I'm holy. You ever think you can do that? <laughs> Do you ever think you could trick people into thinking you're holy? Yeah? We all do. 
We want that so, so bad. I was thinking of a funny story years ago. Uh, I've wanted to be pastor of this church forever. And whenever there was any type of church functions, I was always practicing. And I'm, I'm letting out secrets, people. It's so getting towards the end of my lifetime. I don't know. So letting it all out. I'm letting out secrets. So I'd always make believe I was, I was the pastor and how I would respond. So I was always, and it was, I look back and I go, oh, that's so stupid. That's so ridiculous. I have always was trying to, you know, I, when there was parties, I was always very reserved. I never want, the uh, Christians wouldn't do that. And pondering things and, I mean, what's going on with you? Tell me about your problem. And, you know, it's such a silly thing, but I wanted to appear to be, that I can be the pastor. Boy, did I have a lot of things to learn. Still do. But one thing I never, I never fooled. Because I might have fooled people. Hey, yeah, Scott, he's really pretty holy. He really knows what to say and how to answer everything scripturally. Uh, but it's all, it's all fake, all phony. It's a facade. What's a facade? You know what a facade is? If you go down any of our streets, we have the buildings and they have the facade that makes the building, which isn't too pretty, look a little nicer, okay? It's the facade. And the facade is a covering that we place over our face so we appear to be something that we are not. It's also called hypocrisy, okay? Because we want to look good because we hate people to think that we're not. Because why would I hate people to think that I'm not? Because they might ask me, are you okay? Do you know there are some people, if you ask them if they're okay, they get very offended. Because it's an insult to their pride. How dare you ask if I'm okay? Of course I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> Won't go any further. But God knows. He's such a sad, I, I know so many people breaks my heart. And you know what? More people know it than don't. Most people, they'll start to watch that person and say, that person is living a lie and it's miserable. And the one that they're making miserable is themselves. Because people, we all hurt. We all fall down. We all trip. My wife just came back from North Carolina, and I've, I've shared this before, but it proves the point. She told me she stopped at a truck stop, and she was walking out of a place, and she fell and tripped and fell off the curb, fell on the ground, hurt her leg and stuff, and people came over to run to help her. And she goes, you know what the first thing I felt? Embarrassed. I was so embarrassed. I was actually yelling at the people, I'm fine, leave me alone. I'm perfectly fine. Why do we do that? Pride. Do you know that is the worst sin right there? Because we should say, I'm hurt. I'm normal. When I hit my leg, it hurts. And I'm trying to make people think it doesn't. Because I want them to think I'm better than I am when I'm really not. Because no one of us people are better than we think we are. We're not. We're all longing for the wrong it. And we refuse to admit it. And we refuse to go God's way. And we fight God. People who live this way, they're not fighting you and I. They're fighting God. Their battle is with God. And you could ask Jacob, who wrestled with God. You can't wrestle with God and walk away a victor. We think we can. God says, you wrestle with me, you're going to walk away with a limp, but you'll be glad that you did. Let's go to some scriptures here. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. When we're going to see a theme here. You want to know what you need to long for, people? What I need to long for? And again, the sad thing is, 
I mean, we can preach this, we can teach this. Um, I think one thing God is showing us, we better get it. Because if we don't get it now, what we, how are we going to make it? 1 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. For the kings, or for kings and all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Let's read that again. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead the people that watch us, that they may see that we live a quiet, peaceable life in all godliness, and I love this, and honesty. Don't live a lie, people. If you hurt, let people know you hurt. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4, 7. I'm going to make it easy for you. It's going to go through the first Timothy's. Interesting that this thought is in all, the first, the, all in Timothy here. Paul teaching young Timothy how to be a man of God. He tells 1 Timothy in chapter 4, verse 7, and I'll modify it and I'll say, young Timothy, refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little. You know, and we could add to that not just exercising, but just trying, it goes back to vanity. We've got to look good. We've got to appear good. We've got to walk good. God says that does so little. You fool so little. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Having the promise of life, people, you want to live life to the fullest, it'll be in godliness. The promise of the life that now is and the life that is to come. It is the goal. 1 Timothy 6.3, let's go there. Paul was preparing, because Paul was getting ready to die, and Paul is preparing Timothy. I'm not, you're not going to have me here, Timothy, to guide you forever. There'll be a day when you'll be on your own, and you need to know and remember what I taught you, or this world will eat you up. 1 Timothy 6.3 If any man teach otherwise, and can set not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud. That person who does not do these things, he is proud. He knows nothing. He dotes about with questions and strifes of words. Whereof comes envy and strife and railings and evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing to gain godliness. You know, this is in the church. There are people in the church, supposing they have gained godliness, they have gained nothing. From such withdraw yourself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Wow. Let's go to 1 Timothy 6.10. This is one of the most misquoted scriptures in the world, probably. 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all evil. What do we all think that money is the root of all evil? God never said that. Never said it once. Okay? People, it, it's one of the most misquoted scriptures. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they erred away from the faith 
and pierce themselves self-destruction, self-sadness with many sorrows. Not just some, but many. But thou, O man of God, he's telling Timothy, you're a man of God, Timothy. Flee these things. Don't let them nibble at your feet. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Those are all things we despise. I don't want to be those things. Verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life means your goal is what happens after you die. Forget about here. Whereunto thou art called also and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Now we're going to move up to Titus. Go to the book of Titus, chapter 1. <clears throat> I've never heard anybody named Titus. You guys know anybody named Titus? That would, have, that would have been a... You know somebody named Titus? Yeah, he's in the Bible. Bump. Okay. I never heard somebody name their kid Titus. Would be a cool name. Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith, faith of God's elect, and acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. You can't get to godliness unless you know the truth. In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Verse 10 through 13. <clears> 2 <throat> Peter, it's right after 1 Peter. <laughs> 2 Peter 3.10 But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. You know what's interesting? And it makes me, and this hold there, we're not done there. Everything that we work for and do and we built our lives around, at the end of the day, here, they're burned up. All the goals and the stuff in the flesh that we achieved, you think, wow, I got this plaque, I got this medal, I got this honor. Doesn't mean anything. And like when we watched that movie last night, Indescribable, I keep going back to uh, Voyager taking a picture back at Earth and seeing the Earth as a speck, a speck, the head of a pen. And as Louis Giglio said, all of a sudden, all the things we've accomplished mean nothing except the things we've accomplished for God. Okay? Because God knows everyone on that speck. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Seeing that all these things, verse 11, shall be dissolved. Everything, all your passions and joys, you know what, that old saying, we're not, there is no trailer hitch on a hearse. Okay? One of the saddest things over, over the years is as the older men have passed away in the church, I know Elder Jeff has been there with, them, with me, we would, you know, the wives would call us and say, guys, you want to go check out my husband's tools and take whatever he wants? And I, 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 I must have done that so many times. And I started to have this real strange uh, feeling that I was going through a sacred place, you know, going into this man's shed. And all the things, I remember Bill Tiedemann, you know, going through his stuff and all his tools lined up that he prized and he laid aside and all the things and how much stuff was thrown out into the street. Whatever you don't want, throw it out in the street. And I would take one man's treasure and put it on my, and I thought, I'm going to bring it home and put it on my shelf. And one day my kids will go when I'm gone, and what are they going to throw out? You know what they can't throw out? The things we taught them. Amen. The God that we brought to their lives. The lessons that they saw, that we lived. 
how we handle situations, what's really intense, and we responded in a godly way. Wow, Dad really kept his temper with that one. That's impressive. I'm going to remember that. Verse 11, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought ye to be in holy conversation and godliness? Now let's stop there for a second. God is saying, seeing that all the things that we try to strive for, the people we try to impress, the goals we try, everything we try to do, at the end of the day, they're all going to be dissolved. I was watching a, a, a clip on, I think it was TikTok, a, a TikTok clip that somebody's, I don't follow TikTok, but somebody's shared it on Facebook. And it, it's funny. It, they were showing uh, uh, the drummer who's in Guitar Center when no one's around and when other guys walk in to watch. Because if you ever go to Guitar Center, I was there the other day with my boys. We haven't done it in years. We used to always do it. And, you know, Jacob would play the keyboards. Aaron would go to the guitars. I would go to the drums. It's funny. And I'd watch, because I always have drum sets set up that you can play. And I'd always watch the guys that go sit and play the drum. Because I'm, I'm always ex watching people's motives. And, and you see, especially men, you know, and another guy. So when I walk in there, that's, hey, that's pretty cool. And then they start to play better. And they do a couple of fancy things. <laughs> Why? Because we're constantly trying to impress people. But God is saying all of those things, they're going to be dissolved. They won't matter. A hill of beans. But what will matter is how you carried yourself. Your manner of persons in holy conversations, being honest and upright, humble, 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 and godliness. Verse 12 and 13 says, looking for and hasting unto the coming day of our God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth where dwelleth righteousness. In closing, the question is this. What you and I desire in life will determine what we truly love the most. And people, as the days click on and our years get older, God is always asking the question, what do you really love? What's really your God? Because whatever you desire the most is what you'll put the most effort in to attain. And if you put all your effort in to attaining self-righteousness, I want people to respect me. I want people to love me. I want people to look up to me. I want people to think I'm great. I want people to think I'm special. I want people to think I'm James Bond. Every guy has a secret desire. He wants to be James Bond. So I'm letting it out of the bag for you ladies. We all actually want to be superheroes. Let's just say it like it is, okay? If we could, that's what we want. And we all think that we are. That's why when we're going out with girls, we're like, you know, Jerry Seinfeld does this thing. And he does this, he goes, did you, did you ever see a guy carrying like a mattress on the roof of his car? He's got one, I could hold it. I got my arm holding it. You know, I can do it. We're constantly trying to impress everyone. And God says, I'm not impressed. You're longing for the wrong it. What we should be longing for is godliness. And you know what? Of happiness, happiness will come when we live for godliness. It'll be the natural transition because you can't be happy if you're not godly. You can't put the cart before the horse. You see, God chooses. You know what? We don't choose how things work. God does. You know what? You know what's a fact of life? Water will run downhill. You can't change that. 
It's laws that God has established. You might not like it. That's just the way it goes. And we can't stop the protocols that God, godliness before happiness. And if happiness is more important to you than godliness, then happiness is your God. And God never was. Hmm, interesting. If you see godliness above all else, godly, now there's a problem here. Godliness according to God's laws. Because how many times we could say, oh, I am living godly. Because I haven't done A, B, C, and D. Or I do A, B, C, and D. God says, no, not according to what you think is godly. Because I try the heart. I know the heart according to my way. But if you do seek it properly, joy and peace will be attained. No matter what's going on in the world. Choose you today the right it. Because godliness is the answer to every single issue our world is dealing with. From Congress to Senate to the crime problems to war to everything, to our families, to our schools, to our police, everything. It's all solved through godliness through faith in Jesus Christ and his law for his creation. Have a godly society, have a happy society. Well, what do we have today? Lawless society, not a happy society. We can talk about it all day. You can go, yeah, Pastor, it's so true. But how many of us are really going to change? I give you this challenge. Okay. Start breaking old patterns and start new ones. Say, God, I have to stop these old patterns. Because we all live for this thing of self-preservation. I must preserve my honor. I must preserve my integrity. I must make people think this is who I am. God says, stop living that way. Because you'll always be proven to be who you are. Because one day you'll walk and you'll fall down and you'll trip. You know, the person who falls down and trips and it bothers them a lot is a person who has a problem. I've learned to know that I'm clumsy and I fall down. I don't know where I'm going. And you know what? I have peace with that. Because I don't have to pretend that I'm something that I'm not. Yeah, this is my weakness. A, B, C, D, I could probably go down the whole alphabet. But I know my strengths, too. Okay? And I know what I am good at. And I know what I'm right about. But I'm not concerned about what I'm wrong about, that I have to hide it. I've tried hiding it my whole life. I said, it's so much work. It's easier to laugh at yourself. People, if you can't laugh at yourself, that's a big one. You've got to be able to laugh at yourself and say, oh, what a dumb thing I did today. And that's okay. Seems to be harder for men than women. But it's part of humil humility. And you won't have happiness without humility. Change your patterns. Start new ones. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are a God of patience, Lord. Yet you are a God that loves us, and with frustration you watch over us, and you say, Dear child, why do you suffer so? You are not me. You are not perfect. You fall down. I pick you up. Get used to that. It's okay that you can't pick yourself up, and it's okay if people don't know it. If, and it's okay if people do know it that you hurt and you cry. Father in heaven, help us to stop living for that it and living for the right it, which is, Lord, holiness, humility, and godliness. And we will have happiness, but we cannot upset that apple cart. It must be 
your protocol. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's stand. We'll close with the song.